Good morning. Did you sleep well? So did I until four o'clock. Now we're working through the uh, title of this conference, word by word. First talk was on the end times. Second talk, Israel in the end times. Third talk, now, the church in the end times. You're probably familiar with the word eschatology. It means, or it comes from a Greek word, eschaton, which means the end, the grand finale, how it will all finish. Do you realize what a privilege you have? You're the only people who know how things are going to end. What a privilege that is, because the world doesn't know and they, they can only guess, but we know. Now this morning we're asking, how will church history end? We all know how it's begun, and those who've had teaching know how it's continued for 2,000 years, though I find many Christians don't know what's been happening in 2,000 years and how the Lord has been building His church throughout those centuries. But here we are at the beginning of the 21st century and we may see the end or we may not, we don't know. But how will it end? Will it end on an upper or a downer? Well now I find there's a huge range of ideas on this subject among Christians ranging from the extreme optimistic to the extreme pessimistic. I'm somewhere in between. I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist, I'm a realist. And I believe that's where God wants us to be and take a sober look at the situation. But let's begin by looking at some of the extreme optimistic views. The views that the church will end up bigger and better than ever and even a majority of the population of the world. I regard that as an extreme view, but its theological label is called post-millennialism. And post-millennialism believes that in the name of Jesus, the church will conquer the whole world before he comes back. And we will be able to present to Jesus a Christianized world. Not that everybody in it is Christian, but that Christians will be the majority and will control the governments of the nations. And so a great success story will be the end of the church history. And this post-millennial view has captured a lot of people. It means that the millennium must come before Christ comes. It means that there must be a thousand years of a victorious church ruling the world before Jesus gets back. The one implication of that that I think is that that means Jesus isn't coming back for at least another thousand years because I don't see the church governing the world yet anything like it. And if he's not going to come back till we're running the world, then it's certainly not going to be in my lifetime or yours or anybody's lifetime for the next hundred thousand years. And that's why post-millennial Christians rarely talk about the second coming, because it's just not on the map yet. It's way off the sat-nav off the top of it, and it's not in sight. So if you take the extreme optimistic view of church history, then you're in for a long wait for the Lord Jesus to come back. Many of the Victorian missionary hymns were based on post-millennial thinking, particularly the hymns written in Britain as the British Empire spread around the world, 
Indeed, it was said to be the empire on which the sun never set, because countries in the British Empire stretched right around the globe, and my school atlas was full of red color, not for communism, but for British Empire. And you could literally go around the world inside the British Empire. And with that empire went a missionary optimism because with the British colonizing went missionaries. And they took the gospel wherever the British Empire spread. They followed the soldiers. And therefore they shared this tremendous optimism. If the British people believed they were going to take the whole world over, then that kind of echoed in Christian thinking, well, then the church can take the world over. And the Victorian missionaries were very post-millennial in thinking. I think of one hymn that I used to sing, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth his successive journey run. In other words, there's the optimism that the church is going to take over the world before Christ gets back. There's a, a variety of this called revivalism. It's the belief that before church history ends, there's going to be a huge revival. And this has gone under many names. One is the latter rain, based on the uh, meteorological character of Israel, where they get rainfall two times a year. The early rains, which come in October, usually at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, start the grain germinating and beginning to grow. And then the latter rains in the spring bring the corn to full-headed usefulness. And so you have the early and latter rains. And from that meteorological fact, came the belief that there will be a latter rain revival in the church before the end comes. It's had other names like Manifest Sons of God and various other titles, but it's the belief that there's going to be a huge revival at the end of church history, and the church will bring thousands and thousands of new converts in. Well, certainly, the Lord wants his house to be full. I love the text in, the, um, in Matthew of the great feast, the great wedding feast for the son, where the uh, father who's arranging the banquet says, go out and persuade people to come to my son's wedding banquet. And they go out and find people making excuses. Well, I can't come, I'm sorry, I've started a business. I've just married a wife. And then the owner of the feast says, go out into the country lanes and the byways, but just go further afield. My house shall be full. That's a wonderful text. I love preaching on it. God intends his house to be full and every seat taken, and has told us to go far afield to persuade people to come in. He wants a full house. Nevertheless, I have some doubts about whether there will be a great end time revival. I have those doubts because of some of the things Jesus said, which I'll come to in a moment. That's the optimistic view of the end of church history, a success story, a great success. And it appeals to many Christians, particularly here in America, where I sense that the God of America is spelled S-U-C-C-E-S-S. -S -S. And a successful church is always held up as a model. But what is success? It's not necessarily in quantity. It's also in quality that the success of church life must be measured. Let's move to the opposite angle. I'm meeting an increasing number of Christians in my country who believe that the church is gradually shrinking 
and will go on shrinking and may well die out altogether. But they take comfort in the fact that there is a church on earth and a church in heaven. And theologians call those two churches the church militant on earth, still fighting the battle, and the church triumphant in heaven. And the church in heaven already is a great success story and has had the victory. But the church on earth is still battling. And I'm afraid in my country the pessimistic view is due to the fact that our towns are as full of churches as yours, church buildings, but they're empty and abandoned and turned into stores and even mosques. And when you see the empty, abandoned churches on every street corner, as I see live churches on every street corner here, then you begin to think the church is going to lose the battle. I was at a social occasion, and a very successful businessman came up to me and started to talk, and he said, and what line of business are you in? I said, I'm a preacher. And he didn't quite know what to say. They don't, do they? They try and dig up some second cousin twice removed who once was in the church <laughs> and find some connection with you. But uh, his response was this. What does it feel like to belong to a dying organization? I said, I wouldn't know. Oh, he said, come off it. He said, the church is dying everywhere. And from a superficial observation, he could be right. But I said, the church I belong to isn't dying, it's growing at an incredible rate. He says, oh, which church is that? I said, the Church of Jesus. Now, he'd never thought of that church before. He'd only thought of the church on the corner. And uh, he said, are you serious? I said, every minute I talk to you, there are 60 more Christians in the world. Multiply that by 60, and you know how many there are every hour. Multiply that by 24, and you know how many are coming into the church every day. Multiply that by 7, and you know how many are coming in every week. Multiply that by 4, and it's monthly. Multiply that by 12, and you, I said, if you had as many new customers for your business as that, would you talk about a dying organization? <laughs> well, I won that part of the argument, but lost, <laughs> but lost the next bit. I said, and one other difference between your business and mine, we've never lost a single customer by death. <laughs> and I'm afraid I lost him then. <laughs> he just couldn't figure that one out. But the church doesn't ever lose a member by death. Not the church of Jesus. They're simply transferred to another branch. <laughs> and that's great. But there are those in Britain who think the church is on the way out. And there are professors in Oxford University predicting the death of the church in Britain. And it may well go that way. But that's not the church of Jesus. The church of Jesus is worldwide. And so I'm not a pessimist about the future. I don't think church history will end with the death of the church. Mainly because it's the church of God. That's why I believe the Bible will still be available on the last day of history. Because it's the word of God. That's why I believe Israel will still be there at the very end, because they're the people of God. Whatever is of God has eternity in it. You can't destroy it. So I'm a realist somewhere in between the optimists and the pessimists. And I begin with some of the things Jesus said. On one occasion in Luke chapter 18, very near the verse that is used frequently in IHOP for its justice outreach, the next 
not the next verse, but the next but one says this, Jesus said, will the Son of Man find faith when he comes? And Jesus is there expressing himself, wondering how many will he come back to greet? And he said quite specifically, the way to life is narrow and few people find it. It seems as if Jesus was thinking in terms of a minority, not taking the world over, but a minority of the world waiting for him to come back. And I believe that is what will happen. I believe we are coming full circle in church history. We're coming right back to the early days of church history when it was a persecuted minority in every country and yet was growing. And it seems almost as if the Roman Empire itself is being reborn on the cinema screen in films like Gladiator. That delight in seeing men kill each other or being killed by animals. We wouldn't want it in real life, or would we? We're being prepared for it again by watching it happen on this screen. And some of the video games they're just games, but they're revitalizing the old barbaric practices of the empire in Jesus' day. And so I believe we're coming back to the situation where the church universal will be a persecuted minority. And Jesus himself predicted that. He said, you will be hated by all the nations, hated. It's not very nice being hated because deep down we have a desire to be accepted and loved and not rejected. And we are going to have to face that as we get nearer to the end of church history. I believe Jesus' words will come true. But I don't get depressed by that. He went on to say, the love of most will grow cold. The love of most will grow cold. And then he said a lovely thing, and the gospel will be preached to all the nations, and then the end will come. I believe that's coming true before our very eyes. Christians are beginning to be hated in almost every nation. They are the conscience of the nation. They are the challenge to the nation in which they live. And people don't like conscience. They don't like challenge. And so we are going to be more and more unpopular. Or take another parable of Jesus, the wheat and the tares. When wheat and tares, tares, by the way, are a poisonous weed, when the wheat and tares begin to grow, they look much the same. But as they develop and as they produce fruit, suddenly you begin to see they're very different. And they're still together, growing. And therefore I assume that the kingdom of Satan is going to grow and the kingdom of God is going to grow and the difference between them will become more and more apparent. And it's that difference that will produce the tension and the conflict between the two. So I see a church, yes, growing, but becoming under increasing pressure, and under pressure, completing the job we've been given to do. And wherever the church is persecuted today, they are growing. Where the church is not persecuted, it's becoming very comfortable and may be growing due to other factors in quantity, but not necessarily in quantity. Persecution from outside improves the quality of the people inside, but reduces the quantity. And that's going to come as we get nearer to the end. So I'm trying to be a realist. 
history is coming full circle back to where the early church was. But the early church grew and conquered Rome so that we are both pessimists and optimists, but realists right in between. The third sign that Jesus gave us of his coming was universal trouble, universal persecution. And he said, unless those days had been kept short, even the elect, the chosen people of God, would not survive. So I want to tell people we're in for tough times. But now I must deal with what I believe is a false prophecy, false teaching, which is capturing many, many Bible-believing Christians and is not the truth. I'm going to be very frank with you now. In the 1830s, a totally novel idea was born. Up till then, every Christian expected the church to be in the big trouble, to be in the great tribulation. But in 1830s, and here I have to confess, due to an Englishman, not an American, an Englishman who was living in Ireland in the capital city of Ireland, Dublin. He was an Anglican in the Church of England. His name was John Nelson Darby. And that man introduced a totally new idea to the Christian church, which has now spread rapidly, and I have to say has captured America and is being exported by this country to the rest of the world. And it is basically and simply the idea that Jesus is coming back twice. Not once, twice. And that his first coming back will be secret, private, and his second coming back will be public. And on that first private secret visit, he will snatch all true believers out of the church in what is usually called the rapture and will take the church away or out of the big trouble. I don't call that eschatology, I call it escapology, if you know what I mean. That's the science of escape, of getting out of problems. And that, as you know, has now become widespread. Brother Darby developed this theme against his close friends because he had started a movement called the Brethren Movement. Some of my family belonged to the Brethren Movement. One of them, one of my ancestors, took the Brethren Movement right down the coast of Brazil and planted brethren meetings right the way down the coast. I only found that out when I went to Brazil. And you must have heard of the brethren movement because it's here and very strong. What happened was that Darby came to America and was used of the Lord to bring a lawyer, Cyrus Schofield, to the Lord. And Brother Schofield decided to put Darby's teaching into a Bible. And it became known as the Schofield Bible and became the most popular version of the Bible in America. Many Pentecostals in the early days of the Pentecostal Church, which was virtually born at the beginning of the 20th century, grew up on the Schofield Bible. I'm going to say something that may shock you. Never buy a Bible with human notes in it. By all means, buy commentaries and books about the Bible, but don't buy a Bible with any human comments in. And I'll tell you why. 
I'm getting old now and my memory's beginning to fail and I'm really beginning to realize there are two signs of old age. One is a bad memory and the other... <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> But even if you've got a brilliant memory, you will not be able to recall whether something you read in that annotated Bible was in God's Word or in man's comment. Or to put it this way, you won't remember whether you read it at the top of the page where a God is speaking or the bottom of the page where some human being is adding his comments. And that's why the Schofield Bible did so much damage. Because in the human notes was this new theory that Jesus is coming back twice. First to take the church out of the world before the big trouble and then coming back with the church later, some years later, publicly and openly manifest. Now that has captured the imagination of so many Christians, particularly in this country. You have even whole seminaries based on that teaching, like Dallas Seminary. You have authors writing books purveying this same idea, such as Hal Lindsey, such as the novels Left Behind, I'm naming these because I believe all this needs to be exposed as unbiblical. Because it's affecting, it's affecting even our attitude to Israel. For the majority of Christian Zionists in America hold this view. We call it the dispensational view. And I couldn't possibly have the courage to go to Israel and say, I'm an evangelical Christian, I stand with you, Israel, I will stay with you even if the world leaves you, but any day now, I'm going to leave you. <laughs> and I'm going to leave you in the big trouble to look after it for yourself. I couldn't say that. It's hypocrisy. And to develop this teaching a little, because it's so important, the point I'm making, and I tremble before God. If I'm wrong, please, God, forgive me. But I cannot find a single verse in the Bible that says clearly and unambiguously, Jesus is coming back twice. Can't find it. And the next thing that that view takes is this, that the signs of his coming are all connected to the second, second coming. And therefore, there are no signs whatever about his first secret coming. It means that the rapture, as it's called, could happen any minute, could happen today, tonight. And I've come across children who are told by their parents, unless you make a decision for Jesus, You'll, you could wake up tomorrow morning and your parents will be gone. That's wicked. It really is. I believe in the fear of the Lord, but that's not the fear of the Lord. That's of something else. So that the first, second coming, secret, nobody will know it's happening. They'll just see half the world has disappeared or maybe the bus driver's gone or the pilot in the aircraft has seat is suddenly empty. That kind of teaching you don't find in Jesus. What you do find is that when he does come for the one and only return, there will be some totally unprepared and totally surprised. But Paul, after describing the rapture, by the way, I believe in the rapture. I believe that we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. It's biblical. The question is not, will I be, but when will that be? And when I have met the Lord in the air, do we go up or come down? That's the difference. But I believe we shall be caught up with the Lord in the air. And the Latin word for caught up is rapto, 
And that's where the word rapture came in. It's not an emotional excitement word. It's a word meaning snatched up. And I'm looking forward to being snatched up to meet the Lord in the air if he comes back before I'm gone. But as I told you yesterday, I'm beginning to wonder if there's time for him to get back before I'm gone. But not to worry, get the front seat at the big meeting, remember? Well, now, this was the teaching that really got hold. Since 1830, it's as novel as that. And it's spread widely in your country. And it's now held by the majority of evangelicals in America. And I'm thrilled that America is sending missionaries all over the world. You've taken over from Britain here. Britain used to be the great missionary sending country. Now you are. But with the gospel is going this theory, this false prophecy, which is giving people a false hope. And I know that it appeals to human nature. If I was faced with the choice of two truths, either that I will be in the great tribulation and I have to go through it, or that I will escape before it comes, I'm going to believe the escape. I don't want to be in big trouble. I'll listen to that. Hallelujah, I'm off tomorrow or even tonight. There is nothing in Scripture to say that Jesus can come back at any moment. I told you yesterday, there are 20 predictions yet to be fulfilled. They may come quite quickly, but 20 is quite a lot to be fulfilled before he gets back. And I'm watching for those things to happen. That's what Jesus said, watch and pray. And he didn't mean that we go around looking into the clouds waiting for him to come. There was one church in the southern states here that had a roof that rolled back and opened the church to the sky. And everybody said it was so that they were ready to, for the rapture when it came. <laughs> Actually, it was for the hot summers to cool it off. But I had to counsel a lovely young lady who spent all her spare time in the cemetery where her parents were buried, hour after hour, because she wanted to be caught up with her father and mother. That's neurotic. And I had to help her out of that. We're not to be watching the clouds. We're to be watching for signs on earth of his coming and praying for insight, and praying particularly that we will not be deceived. But I have to say that I believe this teaching has deceived many Christians. And I want to go into it in some detail in a moment to say why I don't believe it. The main reason is there is not a single verse in my Bible that says he's coming twice and that there will be a private coming followed some years later by a public coming. Not one verse. Where then do these Christians get it from? They get it by using something we call eisegesis. I'm sure you've heard of the name exegesis, and it comes from the Greek word ex, which means out, exit. And exegesis is bringing out of Scripture what is already there. Eisegesis comes from the Greek eis, which means into. And that word means reading into Scripture something that is not there. And I believe that this teaching has come out of eisegesis. I mean by that that in the absence of clear simple statements. This teaching is built up from implication, from deduction, from starting with a text and then reading something out of it that isn't in it. And there are five arguments, seven, sorry, that are used to support this teaching, which I want to just run through and give you a counter-teaching for each so that you can weigh this up and balance it for yourself. The first 
I give as the word speed. The Bible does say, Lord, come soon. Lord, come quickly, which always gives a sense of it's only just round the corner. But soon for God is not soon for us. And a thousand years is just a day to God. It's been a couple of days since Jesus went back to heaven. And that gives you the right perspective of time. Yes, humanly speaking, we want it to happen tomorrow. Or by next Tuesday at the latest. <laughs> and as I told you yesterday about the American preacher, Phillips Brooks, he said, the trouble is that I'm in a hurry and God isn't. We are impatient people. And when we say soon, we mean ours. But the Bible thinks in God's time. And when John wrote his letter, he said, little children, it is the last hour. Now take that in human terms of time. What does it mean? But take it in divine time, and you're getting a right perspective. The mills of God grind slowly, but they grind exceeding small, said a, an English poet. God isn't in a hurry. He took thousands of years to get the world ready for his son. And so the language of speed does not necessarily mean it's going to be tomorrow. It means that we long to see it and we want it to be soon as possible in God's good timing. But even within the New Testament, they had problems with human time being mistaken for God's time because the second letter of Peter deals with Christians then who said, where is the promise of his coming? Everything's just the same as it's always been. And they were ridiculing Christians who believed he was coming soon. Well, I believe he's coming soon, but it's God soon. And I've got to be patient and wait for God in his own good time. The second scripture to which this theory appeals are the scriptures that say he is coming like a thief, like a burglar, unexpectedly, that people are not ready for him. And that will be true for the great majority in the world who have never even given a thought to Jesus coming back again. But it will not be true for believers. And Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, you will not be taken by surprise because you are awake, you're alert, you're not drunk, you're sober. And you will know when he's coming, you won't be taken by surprise. You'll be like the householder who heard that a burglar might come that night and he stayed awake and was watching and saw him coming. Christians, many churchgoers, will just be totally caught out by surprise, but genuine Christians who know their Bibles will be watching and waiting and will see the signs of the thief in the night coming and will be ready for him. Interesting picture of Jesus coming, that he's coming like a thief, what an extraordinary idea. But he will, he's coming to rob the world of everything the world counts valuable. He's coming to take from the world all the world's been working for and waiting for. He will be a thief to those who are not watching, not to us. Third argument they make is that the different language and different words of Scripture point to these two events. But when you read carefully all the vocabulary of the second coming, you cannot divide them into two. They are interchangeable. They all apply to one second coming. And you can't say this word applies to the first and this word to the second when the words keep swapping over. Again, I've got a book in which all these arguments are given in full detail, I commend it to you. When Jesus returns, and there's a whole section dealing with these arguments. The next one is that the Christians in the New Testament expected Jesus back any day, 
so should we. But they didn't expect him back any day. In fact, it said to John, if you're still alive when I come back, that's what business is that to you, Peter? And he told Peter that when he was an old man, they would crucify him and carry him where he didn't want to go. When he was an old man. So surely Peter didn't expect Jesus back any day. And again, when you look closely into the scripture, they wanted him back as soon as possible, but none of them ever said it could be today or tomorrow. They didn't think that way. A further argument is used that in the middle section of the book of Revelation describing the big trouble, the word church doesn't appear. Therefore, the church isn't in it. But there are whole chunks of the New Testament where the word church doesn't appear, but where the word saints appears and where the word elect appears. These are other words for the church. And right in the middle, in Revelation 14, it talks about these are the words for the saints. Which saints? The only saints I know are us. We are the saints of God now. The final argument which has been used, no, the sixth argument, is about the bowls of wrath. You remember that the 21 problems of the big trouble finish with seven bowls of wrath outpoured on the earth. And they then go to a statement in 2 Thessalonians which says, we are not children of wrath. Therefore, we can't be on the earth when God pours out the bowls of wrath. But listen, when you read the bowls of wrath, you are reminded forcibly of the plagues in Egypt which God poured out in his wrath on Egypt. And none of those bowls of wrath touched God's chosen people. None of them. And the big final one, the death of the firstborn, didn't touch God's people because they were under the blood of the Lamb, which they'd put on the doorpost. God is perfectly capable of pouring his bowls of wrath on the earth and making sure that his people on earth do not suffer. And he can keep us safe. And finally, the argument goes that surely when Paul talks in 1 Thessalonians 4 about the rapture being caught up to, with Christ in the air, he's telling them this for their comfort. I agree. What comfort it is that we shall be caught up with Christ in the air. But they then argue, how can anybody be comfortable if they're going to go through the big trouble? Well, that kind of comfort Jesus didn't promise us. He said, in the world you'll have big trouble, great tribulation. But cheer up, he said, I'm on top of it. And that's how we react when big troubles come and we're under it. The word tribulation is a fascinating word. It's from a Latin word, tribulum, which in turn goes back to something that is uh, very practical in Jesus' day. A tribulum was a big square piece of wood, usually made up of three layers joined together. A heavy block of wood, about maybe five feet square. And on the underside, there were hollows, and into those hollows were forced flint stones. So if you can imagine a heavy block of wood and on the other side projecting stones, sharp stones, stuck into the wood. And this was used for threshing corn. And a donkey would pull it round and round and those stones would break up the corn and separate the wheat from the chaff. That's what a tribulum is. And that's what tribulation is. 
when you feel you're under a heavy load that's tearing your life to pieces. That's tribulation. And so uh, that's where the word comes from, the great tribulation. But it's related to our word trouble as well. Well, the comfort is that it's only going to be for a short time and then Jesus will be back. That's real comfort. Comfort to us means a hot water bottle. No, you don't have such things here, do you? You have electric blankets, do you? Well, comfort is not being wrapped up in cotton wool. The word come fort means to be made strong and fortress-like. That's real comfort. Well, there are the seven arguments. I've rushed through them. None of them is based on a clear statement in the Bible. All of them are human deductions from statements in the Bible. Be very wary of preachers that make deductions from the Bible of their own and cannot quote plain statements for what they teach. Well, the end time has a huge city. Charles Dickens wrote a book called The Tale of Two Cities. And you could almost apply that to the last chapters of the book of Revelation. One is the city of Babylon, and the other is the city of Jerusalem. One is a likened to a filthy prostitute, and the other is likened to a pure bride. It's an amazing contrast between those two cities. One is the city of man, the other is the city of God. One is built up, the other comes down. A complete contrast. And the Bible ends by saying, which is your citizenship? Which city do you belong to? But the interesting thing is that Babylon, it isn't a religious city. If anything, it's a very secular city. It's devoted to money-making and pleasure. That's why it's called a prostitute, because you associate pleasure and money-making with a prostitute. And that city, God says, is drunk with the blood of saints. And Christians who remain in that city are likely to die. And so the Christians are told, come out of that city. They're not told, I'll take you out. They're told, come out. Get out while you can, but don't take part in that. I see that city as a kind of mixture of Las Vegas and Wall Street. I don't know where it'll be. It won't be where the old Babylon will be because that's inland and this is clearly a coastal city. I begin to think it might be on the Pacific coast, somewhere like Shanghai, which is becoming a major money-making center in China. I don't know where it'll be, but it'll be the city that will be the center of world commerce and world pleasure at the same time. And that's where the world is heading. Money and pleasure, notably sexual pleasure, are the two big things that people are living for. And all that will climax in Babylon, drunk with the blood of the saints. It's a horrible picture, but it's the truth. And one day that great metropolis will control the world. Do you like Handel's Messiah? Do you know what I mean, the oratorio? Do you love the hallelujah chorus in that? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. It really gets you going. But do you know what it is? It's a celebration of the collapse of the world economy. It's the celebration of stocks and shares becoming worthless bits of paper. It's the celebration of a world economy collapsing and the banks closing and all your savings and all your pensions disappearing. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> because that is taken from Revelation 19 and it's a celebration of the collapse of Babylon. And the only people who are shouting hallelujah will be the God's people. When all the banks fail and your savings disappear 
who but God's people will be singing the Hallelujah Chorus. And when I listen to Handel's Messiah and they get to that marvellous chorus, I want to get up and shout, do you realise what you're saying? <laughs> do you realise what you're celebrating? I was invited to go and speak at the London Stock Exchange. <laughs> Can you imagine a better opportunity than that? And they said, would you please give us a title for your talk to advertise beforehand? I said, yes, I can give you a title. And it's this, you can't take it with you, and if you could, it would burn. <laughs> and and the, they said, we can't advertise that. <laughs> I said, well, you wanted a title, and that's what I'm going to talk about. And uh, they said, well, I'm sorry, but we won't advertise that. I said, all right, I'll change it. And I changed it to how to invest your money beyond the grave. <laughs> and they did accept that. And I expounded Luke chapter 16 to them, where Jesus taught us how to invest your money beyond the grave. Because everybody I know is worried about their pension and how they're going to survive when they retire and how they can then enjoy themselves if they haven't got any money. This is their thought, putting all their money into life before the grave. But Jesus told us how to invest beyond the grave. You can take it with you. A shroud has no pocket, I know. But you can take it with you by investing in people who will welcome you to heaven. What a wonderful thought. You can use your money to get a good welcome in heaven if you do it Jesus' way. You see, Babylon is the ultimate end of the world's ambitions. All the pleasure of the world, all the money of the world focuses in that city which will prostitute itself to draw human beings into ruin. But there's a new Jerusalem, a new city built by God. And we are citizens of that city. Let me finish. Whenever God reveals the future to us, he is not doing it to satisfy our curiosity or to make us or give us secret knowledge that we can tell other people we know and you don't. That's not the idea. When God tells us about the future, it is so that you may prepare for it now. We are the people of the future. We are the people who are going to inhabit the new heaven and the new earth. And we are the people who should be getting ready for it now. But even before that comes, we should be getting ready for the big trouble. I'm going to finish this study by reading to you something that a lady wrote which moved me so deeply. Corrie ten Boom, the Dutch lady who was sent to a concentration camp in Germany for hiding Jews in a secret hiding place within their home. The whole family was taken away by Germans. Most of them died, but Corrie survived. And she's traveled the world since, though she's died now. How many of you actually heard Corrie ten Boom speak? Quite a lot of you. How many of you have heard about her or seen the Billy Graham film, The Hiding Place? Well, now, this is what Corrie wrote after her visit to China. I have been in countries where the saints are already suffering terrible persecution. In China, the Christians were told, don't worry. Before the tribulation comes, you will be raptured. Then came a terrible persecution. Millions of Christians were tortured to death. Later, I heard a bishop from China say, sadly, we have failed. We have made the people strong for, we have, 
we should have made the people strong for persecution rather than telling them that Jesus would come first. Turning to me, he said, tell the people how to be strong in times of persecution, how to stand when the tribulation comes, to stand and not faint. And Corrie adds, I feel I have a divine mandate to go and tell the people of this world that it is possible to be strong in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in training for the tribulation. Since I have gone already through prison for Jesus' sake, and since I met that bishop from China, now every time I read a good Bible text, I think, hey, I can use that in the time of tribulation. So I write it down and learn it by heart. Poor Corrie, her own tribulation came and she went into a coma which lasted for some years and was totally unconscious. There were only two things to which she made any response during that terrible personal tribulation. One was her nephew, Peter Van Voorden, whom I know, who was the nephew that dressed up as a schoolgirl and rode a bicycle through Amsterdam to avoid German attention. But he was a violinist, and he would sit by Corrie ten Boom's bedside and play the violin to her, and she would respond. She would make a little movement, showing that the music was reaching her spirit. The only other thing, and I never knew about this, to which she responded during that terrible last few years of her life were tapes of my teaching on the Bible. I didn't even know she had them. But again, when they were played and she heard the word of God, her spirit responded. And when you're in a total coma, physically, your spirit is still alive and can respond. So though she didn't see the great tribulation, she had a big trouble of her own. But she went through it because she'd stored the word of God in her heart. And the music and the word of God kept her spirit alive until her body died. Music and the word of God go together, as they surely go together here at IHOP. <laughs> and we shall, tonight, when we look at the closing chapter of Habakkuk, we're going to sing the last chapter. We're going to read it first, and then we're all going to sing the whole chapter, because it's set to music in the Bible, and we shall do the same. Well, let's have a little break. I'm ready for a coffee, <laughs> and so are you. So let's go and have one and come back in quarter an hour. <laughs>